You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half and the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. Everybody and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, with me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. And first things first, I want to apologise if I sound funny. I am quite unwell and um, I've got a chest infection and a bunch of other stuff wrong with me, like just so much. I'm just a broken human, but you know that. So I'm late in getting this out to you, um, but I, it's spooky season and I have to and I can't, I can't let you down with this. And so here I am, desperately trying to do this and hoping the painkillers will kick in soon. Drugs. Give me all the drugs. There is so much spooky stuff I want to cover this month. We've got vampires and cannibals and witches and other things historically that I can actually explain to you but they're coming and and they're they're gonna be here and I'm very excited to talk to you about it but um I also want to thank everybody who has been still giving me wonderful five-star reviews you're just you're just amazing and uh, it's it's really been cheerful when I'm like holed up in bed feeling like crap and um posting pre-recorded videos because I just I don't have the energy to film right now and I'm just like, just getting these really nice comments. It's just, it's very nice when you're like stuck feeling miserable like this. Um, also, sorry, I can feel my like chest wheezing. Also, uh, the Irish Podcast Awards are on in November. The day after my birthday, by the way. So I'm just saying it'd be a really nice birthday present if I were to win the listener's choice. Um, so you basically click on the link, type in your email address, we type in my name, who did what now? And then vote, and then email address, and then, uh, yeah, 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 click on the link and verify it. And there you go. It's basically so that one vote per, per email address goes through, effectively. And it would be really nice. The voting's up until October 19th, so it'd be great to have like a late rush of, of stuff going in. I'm just saying. But also, this October, what is happening is I am doing my first live Irish show in Dublin. Not in Irish. I'm not going to do it all in Irish. It's going to be in Ireland, but not in Irish, because, God, I, I'm not that fluent. No, 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 no. But anyway, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber. In fact, me. In fact, you, I will. But first, we're going to get our source on. Our sources are A General History of the Lives, Murders and Adventures of the Most Notorious Rogues by Captain Charles Johnson. Horrible History Scotland by Terry Deary. Come on, you think I was not going to do something without horrible history in here? Hey, hey, hey. One bloody thing after another by Jacob F. Field, The History of the Kingdom of Scotland, by Richard Burton, The Newgate Calendar, Historic UK, and of course our favourites, History.com, Atlas Obscura, and a bonus shout-out to the Edinburgh Dungeon. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then let's begin. 
Let me take you back, gentle friend, to the 16th century. And young Alexander Bean, was he an only child? Did he have siblings? Don't know. We don't know that. There is no information. But young Alexander Bean, which honestly, very unusual name in Scotland, just saying. I mean, after this, if you were called Bean, you would probably just change your name. Because you could. But anyway. Alexander was the son of a ditch digger. His father was well liked in the community. He worked hard. He was just, you know, salt of the earth. Just a really good fella, you know. And he was a ditch digger. And you're thinking, that seems like an occupation. It was. Because you're in the fucking countryside. And it's the 16th century. And irrigation is a thing. You need to make sure that all your land is drained properly. You know, you need to make sure that your plants and your agriculture is going to get, you know, the right amount of water, isn't going to get flooded, so on and so forth. There was a purpose to ditches. Also, depending on the region, there's a possibility there could have been um, digging turf or peat if the ground has enough nutrients in it, you know. But yeah, his father was known for being helpful and kind and just a really hard worker, you know. And this is close to Edinburgh, in the vicinity, ish. And Alexander, he is a uh, work shy, right? Work shy. Basically, he doesn't want to dig ditches because that just seems like a bit too much work. Like, I get it. I mean, manual labour is hard. So he decides, you know, I'm going to make my own way. I'm going to live my best life. I'm going to go out into the world. And as he, you know, stomps out, leaves his family behind to fend for themselves. Um, Because, like, once they get to a certain point, like, their age is going to become an issue. But I think because they were such upstanding members of the community... They probably got some help later on. But Sonny, as he becomes known, falls in love with Agnes Douglas, known as Black Agnes Douglas. Now, I don't know if this is to do with her having like sallow skin and dark hair, or if it's something to do with her being like dirty, like actually like mucky. Uh, Because I know up until I was a child, the phrase, that's black, would mean that something was dirty. Like, mock it, you know, same kind of difference. Or, behind mystery door number three, black refers to black magic, because black Agnes Douglas was a witch. Or, many people claimed she was. Now, Agnes and Sonny, they get married. How? I'm not sure. Was it in a church? Probably not. She's a fucking witch. Generally looked down upon by, you know, the clergy as a general rule. Maybe it was a non-denominational ceremony. Maybe she wasn't actually a witch and people just didn't like her. Whom's to say? Whom's to say? So Agnes and Alexander, Sonny to his friends, they leave East Lothian because wherever they go, Things just aren't working out for them. You know, probably because he's work shy and she's a fucking witch. So, bit of an issue there. So they're going around uh, trying to find places to stay, but they don't have steady work. They don't have an income. And neither one of them has a skill in order to maintain an income. And so they're doing general thievery, this, that and the other. Scrounging, begging, other such things. And so they end up leaving East Lothian, which is just outside Edinburgh, right? And they go all the way across the country in Scotland. Did I mention we're in Scotland? I feel like I should have mentioned we're in Scotland. We're in Scotland, by the way. 16th century Scotland. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I is still on the throne in England. And King James VI of Scotland, soon to be James I of England, is sitting on the throne in Edinburgh. King James VI is 
Mary Queen of Scots son. Context. So, Sonny, he and Agnes make it all the way to Ayrshire, which incidentally is where I used to live. So, they're in Ayrshire. I used to live in Kilmarnock, which I think is North Ayrshire. I think. Anyway, they get to South Ayrshire and they get to Garvin and such. And Sonny, like most of us, not a big fan of landlords. And he proposes an idea to Agnes. Babe, wifey, love of my life. Imagine this. Instead of living in the town in a building that we have to pay for, why don't we go live in a cave by the sea, which is free? Now, I know what you're thinking. Living in a cave by the sea in a country known for wind and rain may not seem like the most ideal of choices, but it worked for these two. Now, geographically, it's a little hard to pin down. However, the belief is that the cave that the beans resided in was between the basically Ballantrae and Garvin. The Ballantrae is a tiny wee town and it has, sidebar, and it has this um, little shop in it. I got stranded there because the river burst and I got stranded there one time when I was travelling between Scotland and Ireland. And there was a wee shop and it made the best roll and slice. I have never enjoyed a roll and slice like I have in that wee shop. I hope they did not use Sonny Bean's recipe. Anyway, there's this cave, um, basically in Benin Head, and um, people say it's Sonny Bean's cave. That's the theory. See, a cave like this is really fucking handy, right? Because instead of the cave entrance going down, the cave entrance goes up. It's really hard to get to. You can have to scale it to get in. And because it goes uphill instead of downhill, when the tide rises, the entrance is blocked by the sea. So when the tide's in, you don't notice it's there. It's really fucking clever. I mean, how long he took, like, trying to find the perfect cave? Like, was it, like, location, location, location? He's just trying to, like... Scare out, this is the perfect one. How did you find it? Well, I scaled a bunch of these rocks and decided this was just the exact place I want to be with my wife. Raise a family and whatnot. So there we go. He has what some could call an abode. Another thing about Scotland, it's a temperate zone. It's not quite, you know, the warmest of places. So when the tide rises and it blocks the entrance by like whatever, how many hundred metres, I don't know, um, my spatial awareness isn't great, but like when that's all blocked off, it stops the wind coming in, you know? So it's kind of it's kind of avoiding that cold air. Like, I don't know, like a natural draft excluder, one could say. And there we go, the first on the step of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Come on, you thought I wasn't going to mention it. Of course I'm going to mention it. Right, so they have shelter. They have shelter, that's one. Now they need security. So he has to find a way to, you know, earn a living. And, you know, again, work shy and a witch. What the fuck are they going to do? Well, Agnes, she generally stays in the cave. Like, I mean, I, I don't know... If it was, like, too much hassle to get out of the cave, or maybe she just liked being in the cave all the time, or perhaps she was agoraphobic and was quite happy staying in the cave. You know? Maybe? Hmm? Anywho, he's like, I gotta provide for my new wifey. So what does he do? Obviously. Lots of little roads along the coast... Going from one town to another, travellers, traders, so on and so forth. 
I mean, I was going to say daylight robbery. It's not daylight, though. Nighttime robbery. Under the cover of darkness. And so Sony starts being a highwayman. But not like Dick Turpin. Oh, by the way, Dick Turpin, um, also a dick. But we'll discuss that another time. He starts just robbing people. Which is, you know, fair enough. 16th century Scotland. You live in a cave. You're going to rob some people. And so he starts robbing them. And then he's like, oh, okay, what if they what if they recognise me? Best thing to do is to get rid of the witnesses, right? So he just starts killing them. After he robs them. Or kills them, then robs them. I'm not sure exactly how that process worked. I'm sure it was a trial and error thing. He would rob them first, then kill them. Or he would then kill them, then rob them. Because the last thing he wanted was to lead people back to his cave where his lovely wife was. And so over a period of time, he's thinking, what am I going to do with these dead bodies? People are going to start noticing them. Because he might be work shy, but you know, not an idiot. Thinking logically about this, rationally, some might say, is it? No, it's not fucking rational at all. This is crazy. He's like, what am I going to do? Oh, I know. We'll just eat them. Which, by the way, absolutely bonkers. Here's the thing. If the answer is cannibalism, ask a different fucking question. Because here's the thing. I feel like murdering, transporting, butchering, and then disposing of the remains of a human body seems a lot more complicated than, I don't know, poaching, foraging, stealing carrots from the farm down the road. It just seems like you really just wanted the other, other white meat. I mean, let's face it, it is a high protein diet, but God, have some veggies, man. Like, no. I mean, I'm saying no, but clearly Sonny and Agnes are saying yes. Well, she doesn't really have much choice in the matter. She's stuck in the fucking cave. And also pregnant. Because see, what happens is this couple start having babies and they have at least was it 15 I think no 14 they had 14 beanie babies I regret nothing so they had six daughters eight sons that survived into adulthood I feel like there was probably more and it's probably best we don't dwell upon that concept of what would happen to stillborn babies and the bean clan that's just fucking horrible and so for the next 25 years the cannibal clan grows and grows continuing to terrorize the roads of south ayrshire and as this family grows multiplying within itself. Remember how I keep saying your family tree should not be a wreath? Your family tree should not be a bloody wreath. So here it goes, swirling and swirling. They end up with 14 children. Six daughters, eight sons, 18 grandsons and 14 granddaughters. There's a fuck ton of Beanie Babies. Fuck ton of Beanie Babies. So many. So there they are. And over 25 years, I mean, you're thinking, Sony isn't so spry at this point. But apparently, that incredibly high protein diet seems to work for all the gym rats. Also worked for Sony and his cannibal clan. So the girls and women... They would stay inside the cave. They had learned to butcher and strip the bones. And, you know, all the things that women do in 16th century caves, I guess. Well, the men and the boys, apart from, like, the infants, one would assume, they had spent the last 
quarter of a century, refining their craft. And by refining their craft, I mean got really, really good at, like, gorilla murder. That's that's basically it. Like, gorilla murder. Not the murder of gorillas. The other type of gorilla. Like gorilla warfare. They would go out under the cover of darkness. Like, they were generally nocturnal at this point anyway. Because they would stay in the cave during the day. Which, remember... The tide comes up, they're blocked from sunlight. Like, I don't even know if they have oil lamps in there or whether they just got accustomed to the darkness. So, they're doing this. And uh, they would go out in the night and wait for travellers to go across the road. Easier in, like, autumn, winter, when the days are shorter. More night time, easier to catch. Spring, summer, limited window. Just, just put it out there. Like, you gotta be quick when it comes to spring, summer. Just, just facts. So they had become like a well-oiled machine. They were really good at like catching, grabbing a person, and I would assume also their horse. You'd think they would eat more horse. I mean, you'd assume they would eat some horse, right? They wouldn't just waste the horse. You like, you, it, I would be surprised if there wasn't a commotion, you know, at the amount of random horses without people on them. Or why is there an abundance of horse corpses along this road? I don't know. Like, no, no, no. Clearly, the horses would be involved. So they would take everything back to their cave. And they would, you know, the bodies. And also, trinkets, clothes, jewellery, you know, general stuff people had. They collected, they hoarded in their cave, like shitty dragons. Now, one of the jobs that belonged to the women of the cave was obviously the preparation of the meat. And also, preservation of the meat. One of the things they did was pickling. Now, how they did this in a cave when you really needed heat and a lot of vinegar. Like, effectively, in order to pickle it and have it sealed and secure, you heat it up, you boil it. Are they setting fires in a cave? Would not people notice smoke coming from a cave? It just... Mm. Anyway, they would pickle body parts, you know, for later, for a midnight snack, you know, a nibble. And they were doing this over the years. And, and here's the thing. People did notice that travellers were going missing. But again, 16th century Scotland. There's animals. You've got like... Foxes, maybe a wolf or two, a stray dog, I don't know, a deer that's disgruntled. I think the bears had probably died out by then, like, way ancient, like fucking elks. Like, there are these, like, ancient deer that were massive, but I think they're probably all gone at this point. That being said, I'm not exactly an expert on 16th century Scottish fauna. But I still think wolves were about. I feel like wolves, or again, rabid dogs. An angry badger. I'm just listing countryside animals now. I'm like, animals from the British countryside. (laughs) A badger. But no. Initially, you know, the thought was, these are animal attacks, you know? Nothing untoward, because, you know, it's the 1500s. Sometimes bad shit just happens, you know. We've already had plagues, wars, reformations, you know, shit goes down in Scotland. But then, over time, more people were going missing, especially travellers. And suspicion started to fall on 
tavern owners and innkeepers, because generally, these were the last people to see travellers before they, you know, disappeared off the face of the earth. So then when, you know, body parts started washing up on the shore, people started to get suspicious, and then they started to get bloodthirsty. And a bunch of innocent innkeepers, tavern owners, so on and so forth, got accused of murdering these people. And under vigilante mob justice, they were hanged for those crimes. Crimes committed by the clandestine cannibal clan of Sonny Bean and his bloodthirsty brood. But the clan's luck was not going to last forever. In one of the villages nearby, a fair is being held. Which village? We're not sure. What fair? No clue. It's not written down anywhere. But there's an event happening, and a man and his wife are travelling back from the festivities when they are set upon. On a practically moonless night, hands reach out from the darkness and grab the woman from her horse, forcing her to the ground. The boys must have been particularly hungry this night, because they didn't drag her back to the cave first. No. They sunk their teeth and their hands into her, ripping her throat apart with their teeth and drinking her blood straight from the jugular. Her husband absolutely freaking out at what he's just seen, then feels hands upon his clothes and he is yanked from his horse. And as he (sighs) lands to the ground with a thud, he thinks, fuck this for a game of soldiers, because he's just seen his wife ripped apart before his very eyes. And he fights back. He's got a sword and a pistol or at least a dagger and a pistol, there was a blade involved somehow, and he is shouting and hitting, and he is making a lot of fucking noise. And as he's starting to weaken, as he feels this, his muscles weaken and his body being overpowered by the sheer might of this group of men, horses start galloping towards him. He had made such a racket fighting the beans. I'm sorry, that just sounded so anticlimactic. Like, he was fighting the beans. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him, and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown, and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery+. Plus. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. 
Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Yeah, yeah. Just some legumes, don't mind them. Couple of lentils, we chickpea. I know they're not beans, but still, same idea. Um, they're all pulses in the end, are they? Some. Anyway, a bunch of people who were like at the fair or near the fair, they had been at the fair at one point. Anyway, and they show up, torches in hand. Now, naturally, because the way the clan worked was they would attack sneakily. They'd be very sleek at, right? And their whole thing was being clandestine and then overpowering, you know, many against one. But now... A fuck ton of people have shown up and they're like, no. And they bugger off, right? They get the heck out of Dodge and they bugger off back to their cave. So this bunch of fairgoers, they're like, what the actual fuck just happened? And they're freaking out. They're absolutely freaking out. So they go to the local magistrate and they're like, hey, there's this dude who was attacked by a bunch of people and watched his wife get murdered and eaten before his eyes. So yeah, this was the one thing the Bean Clan have never had to deal with. A living witness. Like, no one had ever survived this long. No one had ever made it past them. No one could describe him. No one could explain what had happened. And here he was. Living proof of what had really been happening to those travellers for 25 years. The magistrate is like, well, this is kind of a big deal and we certainly don't have the manpower to deal with it because the police force doesn't exist yet. So I'm going to send a message to the king. And so King James VI shows up with 400 soldiers, right? And a bunch of bloodhounds. And so the bloodhounds lead the soldiers, and of course, King James, to the cave. The cave which was so often overlooked because, you know, high tide, everything else I mentioned before, they're like, nobody could live in this cave. It's a fucking cave. Who lives in a cave? The past? Not us now. No, 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 no. And as they step into the cave, the stench, the repugnant and putrid odour stings the nostrils. And a bunch of the soldiers, of these king's men, are so disgusted by what they're seeing lining the walls of these caves. They just start throwing up, like they are just puking everywhere. Because there are entrails and blood and, you know, fecal matter and whatnot. Because, you know, hygiene not top of the list in a cave. And the clan are holding themselves to the sides of the wall as these men storm through with their torches. They find barrels with body parts. There are items and trinkets jewellery, just a bunch of random shit that they just stole off these people before, you know, eating them. And the clan, they're just frozen, you know, because they've never really been confronted. They never had to deal with this because everything they did was about overpowering other people. Now, what happens next? I've heard it two ways. The first of which being so disgusted and horrified are the king's men and the king at this just awful, vile cave and its inhabitants that they decide to fill the entrance with gunpowder and just blow it up, sealing the beans in the cave leaving them to suffocate. Now, the other version is that when discovered, 
the entire clan, they just give up. They don't fight. They just allow themselves to be captured. And so they are. And they're taken over to Tolbooth Jail in Edinburgh. And then they're moved to Leith. And then Glasgow. And there isn't a trial as such because, you know, overwhelming evidence, definitely guilty. And also, if the king says he wants you to die, eh, it's kind of going to happen, you know? Yeah. Also, the Bean Clan are seen as subhuman, you know? Probably doesn't help that you've lived in darkness most of your life. And you've had a diet of, you know, human flesh for most of it. If not all of it. And also, probably having issues because, you know, all of the incest. A clan that has existed for 25 years with Sonia and Agnes, their children, and then their children. They're being put to death. Fucking children. We don't know if there's infants, it's not explained, we're just told. But if you look at this timeline, it's 25 years, that's... Uh, you take puberty into it, like, there's going to be kids here. So all of the men, all of the men of the Bean Clan, they have... How do I put this gently? Uh, they chop off their ghoulies. Yep. Meat and two veg. Hacked off and then thrown into the fire. Then they do the same with their hands and their feet. And then they let them bleed out. And while this is happening, all of the women and children are watching. And once the men are dead, the women and the children are tied to stakes and burnt alive. And the citizens of Scotland rejoiced. Now, what's weird about this is like, effectively, it sounds like the punishment for treason. Because the punishment for treason at this time was being hung, drawn and quartered. Um, If you're a man and if you're a woman, burnt at the stake. Now, how you can charge a child with treason, I don't know. But it is a weird... A weird death. I'm just... Just saying. And so ends the horrific tale of Sonny Bean and his cannibal clan. Or does it? Now here's the thing. I am obsessed with stories like this. I went to the Edinburgh Dungeon when I was like... 12 or something. And... Uh, they did a thing about Sonny Bean and they still do it now and I was unfairly targeted by the cannibal clan I was also put in a jail cell and I, I'm just saying I'm just saying I was very almost barked too I just I felt targeted I'm just saying but the thing about Sonny Bean is I I'm obsessive I hyperfixate and I look into things and what sounds like a horrific story from the past is, well, my speciality. Sensationalism, misinformation, and fucking propaganda. You see, there is no historical record of Sonny Bean ever existing. Nothing. There is no documentation of the crime of the punishment, you know, it doesn't exist. It's not in any, any 16th century law book. Like, it's, it's not logged. It's not there. And most importantly, this is a story involving King James the Sixth. King James, uh, the one who did the Bible. King James, the fucking arsehole. I hate him so much. I hate King James. I hate him. One day I'll do an episode on him, um, and it'll just be me calling him a bastard the entire time. King James, when he did something, he was kind of vocal about it. Like, 
We all know about the gunpowder plot. We all know about Guy Fox, And nothing really happened. He wasn't even assassinated. There wasn't even a tiny explosion. There wasn't even the possibility of an explosion because there was a fucking rat. You know what I mean? And everybody knows all about it. He kept talking about how he survived, like, the plot and blah, 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 blah. He made such a big fucking deal about it that we all know about. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. We know it, you know? He made a big deal about it. He didn't say shit about this, which should tell you something. There are no contemporary accounts to anything related to Sonny Bean. The first sort of written information we have regarding Shawnee Bean. Shawnee Bean? Shawnee Bean? Like Sean Connery? No, no, Sonny Bean. Is in the 17th century. So like, a century later. And weirdly, crazy random happenstance, um, it shows up in the Newgate calendar. Now, the Newgate calendar was basically this newspaper, newsletter, book, some might say, released by Newgate Prison. Because, like, a lot of famous people, famous killers and whatnot, like, the origin of true crime, some might say, it got published. They would write the tales of, like, this person and the crimes they did and whatnot. But something that started getting really popular was crime fiction. Like, like a Penny Dreadfuls, which wouldn't come around to a little bit later. Like, I think Oliver Twist was referred to as, like, a Newgate calendar. It was basically seen as sort of, I don't know, tabloidy, sort of, you know, not highbrow, effectively. But anything that's made for, you know, regular people is often seen as not highbrow. Like, Shakespeare wasn't made for the elites, it was made for the masses, but because language has evolved, we assume that it's elite, when really, it's just full of dick jokes, man, I don't know what to tell you, it's just full of jokes. And also, incidentally, crime fiction. But yeah, like the Newgate calendar, things like that, it would be like the chat books. If you listen to my series on the five canonical victims of Jack the Ripper, I think it was Catherine Eddowes, who was with Thomas Conway, who would sell chapbooks. So chapbooks would have the tales of true crime, not so true crime, so on and so forth. Just entertainment for, you know, the regular folk, you know. So this story appears in chapbooks in the Newgate calendar in, like, the 17th century. In a very convenient time, which was after, I think, the third Jacobite rebellion against King Charles I. And the way that Sonny and his family are described in this story, they are seen as wild and horrid, and this is what happens if you leave them to their own devices, if you don't control them, you know? This was a way of showing how savage and wild and just how uncivilised the Scots were in comparison to the English. Now, the tales about, like, English killers and whatnot, Welsh even, during this time period, they're never as horrid as what is happening in this particular tale. Now, this story itself does have inspiration before this because there's the story of Christy Creek I think it is and he was a man who was out hunting there was a hunting party and you know there's not a lot of game going on he was a butcher and they're like listen I got skills let's go out let's hunt some food let's go fellas and so out they go into the hills and they're not finding anything And the first thing they do is start eating their horses. And then when one man dies of starvation, Christy's like, "Mm, waste not, what not. 
and thus starts the craving for human flesh. There are some similarities between this tale and the tale of Sonny Bean, except this happened an entire century before. Oh, and I almost forgot, like, the name. The name, right? Okay, so... Sonny Bean. You see, Sonny is short for Alexander, or at least it was at the time. It has gone out of fashion. I can see why. So, you know, we would say, like, Alex or Xander or whatever. Back in the day, they would go... Sony, you know? But Sony, the way that it was used, it was kind of like a mockery name. Um, like, the way Jock is today, like, if you call someone Jock, it's like a sort of detrimental term for a Scottish person. Um, it's kind of like if you call an American, like, boy, just calling them Chad. Just, it's always a Chad in it, right? I was trying to think of like an Irish one and the only thing I can think of is Paddy except for the fact that like there are so many Paddies here that are known as Paddy like it doesn't even it's not even a thing like are you going to try and insult us? Sure go on lad <laughs> take a crack at it like but yeah that's that's one of those things about this tale it's just pure bullshit it's absolute bollocks and I love this story like, I have been obsessed with it since forever, and as much as how horrible, and how much we like to think this is what happens to people, generally, aggressive, incestuous, cannibal clans, not, not really a common occurrence, you know, rare, if ever, some might say. But that is the end of our story. Now... Um, yeah, if you want to go to my Dublin gig, by the way, if you're in Ireland, on October 22nd, 2023, then just click the link in the description down below. Um, also, if you haven't voted for me in the podcast awards, go ahead and do that. Yay! It'd be amazing. And, um, I I do actually have stuff I need to post on the Patreon because it's getting ridiculous now. <laughs> like, I have it there. It's ready to go. I just need to, like, physically post it all I've got to do this thing it does mean having to transfer through like one phone to the other I know which is like the hassle part of it but I'm going to take some lemons up I'm going to take more drugs and I am going to try and get some sleep um, don't forget you can follow me again whips uh, yeah on the socials well, if this is your first time here I'm sorry I'm second I'm usually funnier than this <coughs> okay so recommendation time I'm going to recommend because it is spooky season after all I am going to recommend for reading The Haunting of Hell House by Shirley Jackson for listening hmm just thriller on repeat <laughs> no but seriously um, you should listen to my delicious friend Paul's podcast, Kraken's Cabin. Uh, I think he's reading some really interesting sort of horror stuff, some spooky things over October. You should definitely give him a listen. And for watching Adam's Family Values. I don't care. You should all watch it. It's the best. Go watch it. Debbie. I love Debbie. Debbie would fit in so well the Adams family if she just wasn't so sneaky I'm just saying like they would help her that's all like maybe for the right reasons I feel like they would but yeah Adams family values perfect perfect movie so yes with that I'm gonna bid you all good night adios au revoir au revoir my friends ah, bye bye